By the end of this video, I'm going to give you the secret to storytelling. But I gotta warn you, once you learn the secret, there's no going back. You'll never be able to enjoy a kinda sorta okay film again. On the bright side, knowing the secret makes good movies even better. I'm going to assume you're familiar with the three-act structure, or you've at least heard the term before. If not, I need you to get familiar with it and then forget everything you know about the three-act structure. Because it's outdated and most people use it improperly. The thing is, screenwriters across the world put a significant event that divides the story at exactly the halfway point, so the three acts of a movie are actually four. Remember that, we're going to come back to this later. There are a few popular methodologies writers use to structure stories that I'm familiar with. One of them is the hero's journey, aka the monomyth. Joseph Campbell originally identified 17 plot points which Christopher Vogler later simplified into 12 that he called the writer's journey. It's a tried and true method and tons of Hollywood writers have been using this infrastructure for the past 30 years. Recently though, the Save the Cat methodology has started to gain popularity because its creator, Blake Snyder, has devised a more systematic blueprint for writing a blockbuster movie. It's got that new car smell, so you're more likely to find examples of how this format works with movies you've actually seen. Personally, I don't like the Save the Cat method at all. It's got more than a few problems, and even though I prefer the writer's journey, that system isn't perfect either. One issue I notice is that each style has really great story elements that the other doesn't have. Another problem is that neither method has their steps organized according to proper act structure. Take Save the Cat for example. It's got 15 steps, but 5 of those are in Act 1, and there are only 3 steps in Act 2. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me because screenwriters usually divide a 2 hour movie into 4 equal parts of about 30 minutes each. It'd be cool if the number of elements in each act of the story gave you a good idea for how long that act was supposed to be. Something else I notice is that there's no equivalent of the monomyth or save the cat for people who might be more familiar with video games instead of ancient mythology. Until now, that is. I'm a big fan of the four act structure, so I took all the best elements of the monomyth and save the cat and devised 16 steps that divide perfectly into four acts. But you actually don't want to divide your story into four equal parts. Act 1 is the boring part of the journey, so you want to spend as little time here as possible. And the climax in Act 4 needs to feel fast-paced and chaotic, meaning this part also needs to be shorter than Acts 2 and 3. So I had to play with the formula a little bit. Three steps in Act 1, five each in 2 and 3, ending with another three steps in the final act. This worked for a little while, but I thought it'd be sick if the elements could be split up into acts of equal lengths. And the reason for that is because one of the most important aspects of storytelling is pacing. What I want to do is give a better sense of how writers prevent the important events in a story from dragging on too long or being over too quickly. With a little bit of optimization, I was able to reduce my original 16 elements down to 15, the same number of elements in Save the Cat. That allowed me to split a story up into five acts of three plot points each. To all you aspiring writers out there, you should know that you can divide a story into as many acts as you want. There are instructions out there for how to divide a story into seven or even nine acts. And if you really wanted to, you could classify every element of the monomyth or Save the Cat as its own act. So even if a writer had three acts in mind when they were working on their screenplay, once you know how to identify the elements of a good story, you can find a structure that works for you. For me, five is the magic number. If you break a two hour movie into five acts, each act would be around 24 minutes each. In a 90 minute movie, each act is 18 minutes. You know what I just noticed? I said the word act so many times that it's lost all meaning. Besides, we're talking about video games, right? Those tend to be broken up into levels, or better yet, stages. I read somewhere that all stories are metaphors for the mental voyages our minds go through when exposed to certain stimuli. In other words, stories give us insight into how our subconscious, immaterial mind rationalizes the physical world around us. Pop quiz. What well-known process for dealing with psychological trauma is defined by five stages? Yeah, turns out the five stages of grief are actually a really good representation of the roller coaster of emotions that a protagonist goes through over the course of a character arc. But I'll get to that in a minute. First, I gotta talk to all the naysayers. Cause whenever you talk about story structuring methods, some know-it-all always starts complaining about how they prefer their stories to be less formulaic and predictable. And honestly, that's a natural response. Most good stories, and by relation, most psychological journeys of discovery begin with the rejection of an idea. That's stage one, denial. Here's where it gets borderline paranormal. If you tried to tell a story without these elements, you just couldn't do it. And that's because story structure is deeply rooted in human psychology. Our minds have evolved over hundreds of thousands of years to resonate with a particular narrative style. You could argue that the art of storytelling is actually encoded into our DNA. So don't think of story structuring methods like this as a formula or a template. You can use it like that if you want, but it's better to think of them as game engines for stories. You have a framework to build off of, but you still have to create the art assets, the music, and game logic on your own. It's like building a house. You could hire a team of artisans to build a custom one-of-a-kind house, or you could buy a prefabricated home. Then the way you choose to decorate the interior and exterior is what makes that house unique. I can't overstate this. 
Even if you don't think an outline method is useful, you should at least familiarize yourself with one. After all, you can't tell an original story without first understanding what makes a story cliché. If you don't consider yourself a storyteller, learning story structure can still benefit you. Like I said, this stuff makes good movies, like, really good. But it goes a hell of a lot deeper than that, because knowing the secret can give you the ability to rewrite the operating system of your mind. Let's get into it. First order of business, the five stages of grief, and how they apply to established storytelling methods. Stage 1. Denial. In the hero's journey, this is where the protagonist gets the call to adventure. But they refuse that call because, like most people, their nature is to reject change. There's a greater purpose they're meant to serve, but they're prevented from reaching their full potential because they're in denial. Stage 2. Anger. Here, things get chaotic as the protagonist leaves their safety bubble. Oftentimes, their life gets completely uprooted due to circumstances outside of their control. The hero enters a strange world that vents all its frustrations out on the protagonist like an immune system attacking a foreign body. Stage 3. Bargaining. Things start looking up for the protagonist as they prove themselves to be capable, causing them to switch from being reactionary to proactive. After learning a valuable secret, they start asking questions. Unfortunately, those questions help them avoid some uncomfortable truth, and the antagonist takes advantage of that hesitation. Stage 4. Depression. After falling victim to overconfidence, the protagonist loses everything they've worked hard to accomplish. Overcome by hopelessness, they see no other option but to abandon their quest. They spend some time wallowing in their despair until they find something that convinces them to keep pressing onward. Stage 5. Acceptance. The protagonist finally comes to terms with the role they're meant to play. It's here that they realize their biggest battle wasn't with any outside force, it was with themselves. No longer in denial, they cast aside who they once were and fully embrace the form that their journey has shaped them into. Every single protagonist in any book, movie, or television series you've ever seen has a similar progression system to this. Being able to identify when the main character is going through one of these stages allows you to resonate with their character arc exponentially more than you would have otherwise, which then gives you insight into how to overcome the obstacles in your own journey of personal growth. So with that in mind, let's go over some of the most common plot points that appear in fiction writing. As Joseph Campbell discovered, these plot points have existed in storytelling for thousands of years, so none of this is going to be revolutionary. But I put a video game twist on the labels because I think it'll be more relevant to society as it is now, instead of how it was a couple thousand years ago. Alright, here we go. The player begins in the real world. They've gotten used to their situation, but they want more out of life. There's something they think will make their life better, but something about their personality prevents them from getting it. Suddenly, opportunity knocks. Someone, usually in a position of power, points out the player's biggest flaw. This is the theme of the story. Very important. The player either doesn't think they're ready, or they have a reason to not trust the wisdom they've been given, so they reject the idea entirely. Alternatively, some antagonistic force tries to keep them trapped in the real world. Psych! That's the wrong number! <laughs> Something happens that the player can't ignore. They don't have a choice in whether to stay in the real world anymore, the choice has been made for them. Either they step out of their comfort zone, or they lose everything. The player crosses a portal and steps into another world. This unfamiliar place is the complete opposite of the real world where they started. Where the real world was safe and predictable, this place is dangerous and chaotic. The player encounters friends and enemies who will help and hinder them on their journey. In the process, they're introduced to the rule set of the game. A lot of the time, they're given a magic weapon or a special ability to help them on their quest. The player faces a series of challenges and demonstrates they have the skills to succeed in this new world, but they're still lacking the virtue they need most. The midpoint is an extremely important part of any story. To some writers, it's the most important part. I call it the fulcrum because this is the tipping point of the story. This is where the player switches from a passive role to an active one. Instead of just reacting to everything being thrown at them, they begin to take the initiative. Breaker. Right as the player wins a decisive battle, the villain bounces back stronger than ever and takes everything the player's worked for up to that point. Sometimes this is represented by the player getting thrown in jail. The player is stripped of all their equipment and gets reset back to level 1. They've hit rock bottom. Any hopes they had of saving the day are now vanquished. The bad guys won. It's over. Time for a reality check. Oftentimes the player comes to terms with their failure and they return to the mundanity of the real world. If they don't physically return, they'll get a reminder of what's at stake to keep them going. By some miracle, the player discovers the key to solving all their problems. Something within. The other world has corrupted their mind for the better, and they are reborn from the ashes. The player assembles a team or undergoes a badass training montage before donning their new armor. They're close to their final form, they just need one final push. To start, they're going to show off that new gear by staging an epic dungeon raid. The player goes on the offensive and storms the Overlord's castle. But the player won't be able to defeat the villain until they overcome the personality flaw that the final boss represents. 
After completing the main quest, the player deals in the meta of the endgame. But their job isn't done, because now they have to return to the noob zone and help newcomers reach max level. The player becomes a mentor capable of granting opportunities, then the process starts all over. To demonstrate how this system works, let me give you guys a breakdown of the greatest video game movie of all time, The Matrix. Thomas Anderson is a software engineer for some boring mega corporation. He hates his job, which is why he moonlights as Neo, an underground hacker obsessed with finding international cyber terrorist Morpheus, in hopes he can give Neo answers about what the Matrix is. Neo's boss at his day job delivers the theme in the form of chewing him out. You have a problem with authority, Mr. Anderson. You believe that you are special, that somehow the rules do not apply to you. Obviously, you are mistaken. Then Morpheus gives Neo an opportunity to become the anti-establishment badass that he pretends to be on the internet. Unfortunately, Thomas Anderson has been programmed by society to play by the rules. No way. No way. This is crazy. He rejects Morpheus' advice and allows the agents to arrest him. Trinity shows Neo that the horrible nightmare he had wasn't a dream at all. Jesus Christ, that thing's real! Now Neo has no choice but to believe that reality isn't all that it seems. This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. Neo takes the red pill and wakes up in a horrific, apocalyptic wasteland. There's an adjustment period as he gets used to these unfamiliar circumstances. Morpheus explains to Neo that he spent his entire life inside a computer program created by machines to keep humanity docile so they can be harvested for energy. Unsurprisingly, Neo's mind doesn't know how to cope. Morpheus delivers an extended tutorial as Neo learns how to function inside the Matrix. Then Neo learns how humans exist outside the simulation. Neo goes to see the Oracle to determine if he really has the capacity to be the savior everyone needs him to be. She gives him disappointing news, but he's relieved to have the weight of the world off his shoulders. This is an emotional victory for Neo. He gets to go back to controlling his own destiny. Cypher sells out to the machines. The crew of the Nebuchadnezzar gets ambushed by agents. Morpheus sacrifices himself to save Neo and gets captured in the process. Cypher goes full turncoat and starts executing crew members. Neo and Trinity barely survive, but they return to a broken ship with their leader in the hands of the enemy. Neo blames himself for what happens because everything Morpheus did was for his sake. The agents plan to interrogate Morpheus to find the access codes to the city of Zion. If they succeed, the machines will destroy what remains of humanity. The crew is faced with the option of killing Morpheus to prevent that. At the midpoint, the Oracle gave a major clue about what it means to be the One. Being the One is just like being in love. No one can tell you you're in love, you just know it. With the fate of the world at stake, Neo starts to believe in himself. Morpheus believed something, and he was ready to give his life for what he believed. I understand that now. That's why I have to go. Why? I believe I can bring him back. Neo and Trinity suit up and prepare to storm the military stronghold where Morpheus is being kept. At the end of his journey, Neo fights his own shadow, a representation of the side of himself that he needs to leave behind. Agent Smith is the embodiment of law, order, conformity, and systematic oppression. He's a sentient computer program, a walking, talking set of instructions. And notice that, in order to defeat Agent Smith, all Neo has to do is disregard every single rule about the Matrix he's ever been taught. He literally refuses to play by the rules. You see an agent, you do what we do. Run. You run your ass off. No. Neo casts the rule-abiding side of himself aside like a snake sheds its skin. In doing so, he achieves total mastery over the rules of the Matrix. In other words, Neo is now engaging in the in-game meta after reaching max level in the Matrix Online. I'm going to hang up this phone, and then I'm going to show these people what you don't want them to see. I'm going to show them a world without you. A world without rules and controls, without borders or boundaries. A world where anything is possible. Keep in mind, there's no way the Wachowskis followed this exact structure when they were writing The Matrix. But they did follow a structure. Which goes to show, you can apply any structure to any story, regardless of the method the writer used during the outline process. So what am I going to name this thing? 
Well, I got an idea. The Dead Vector. See, stories are about a dichotomy between two worlds. The player starts in the world of the living. This is a familiar place that's comfortable, but it represents stagnation. In this world, things are static. They always stay the same. But then the player enters a world that's the complete opposite of the place they started. This is the world of the dead, where heroes go to die. That might sound depressing, but it's actually a good thing. In the ancient art of tarot, the death card can mean literal death, but it's usually interpreted to mean the end of what came before. In other words, a great change is going to take place. And that's what the world of the dead is all about. In this place, everything changes, especially the player, as the person they were dies so they can be reborn as the person they will become. That's why death is such an important concept in the new world. Without death, there can be no rebirth. In physics, a vector is a way of representing the direction and amount of force applied to an object. In game programming, objects are given coordinates in the game world, and whenever you want to move an object, you apply a force to it in the form of a coordinate vector. Using vectors, you can either set an object into motion or correct the direction it's moving. The dead vector, then, is the impetus that drives the player into the world of the dead. It's a force that initiates change. So let me give you another demonstration to show how powerful this technique is. The thing about the dead vector, and any story structuring method, is that it's recursive. When I'm writing a book or a movie, every scene follows a variation of this structure. For example, right now I'm working on an epic fantasy novel. If you want to check it out, you can download the first of four episodes for free on the Discord server. Link in the description. When I first started writing, I didn't know the first thing about story structure. Years later, after I had done my homework, I went back and looked at some of my early work and was shocked to see that the plot still followed the hero's journey pretty closely. I know some of you out there might think that should have been a sign that the writing was cliche and predictable, but when I looked at all the works that had inspired me to start writing in the first place, they all followed the hero's journey too. That told me I was on the right track. At the beginning of the project, I would just start writing, making the story up as I went as if I was transcribing someone else's dictation. These days, I try to think of each chapter as a self-contained short story. So before I write anything, I start with the dead vector and plot stuff out. It doesn't always follow the structure 100% to the letter, but the general idea is always the same. The protagonist starts out with a problem they're avoiding. They cross a threshold into an unfamiliar situation. There they find something important, but they lose something in the process. In the end, they press on with the knowledge they've gained. This is actually a simplified version of Dan Harmon's story circle, which itself is just a simplified version of the hero's journey. So again, I'm not reinventing the wheel, I'm just recontextualizing it. At the start of this video, I said I was going to give you the secret to storytelling. Well, I hope you're sitting down, because things are about to get heavy. I'll start us off easy. A good story begins with a strong outline. Every successful writer on the planet has a method for plotting out their writing. Stephen King, one of the most prolific writers of all time, has famously criticized the outline process, calling it the last resource for bad fiction writers. Stephen King is just so damn good that he doesn't need an outline. What he did need as part of his creative process was a metric shit ton of cocaine. And personally, I'd rather go broke than be known for writing a book that features a bunch of sixth graders having an orgy. In a sewer. That's just me, though. Think of it like this. There are some artists out there like Kim Jung Gi that can draw freehand from memory without any reference material. Artists like that practice for years to become true masters of their craft. On the other hand, most people, including some of the most talented illustrators and animators on the planet, start with a blueprint. Story structuring methods are just like the stick figures you might find in an art tutorial. It's designed to help you develop your skill set. And as your skills in the art of storytelling progress, you'll find yourself needing the blueprint less and less. I'm gonna say it again until I drive the point home. It's about finding the method that works best for you. Even if a writer doesn't make use of an outline when they write, you're still gonna find these plot points in any story out there. Because like I said, over thousands of years, our minds have evolved to be receptive to a certain style of storytelling. Now here's where it gets downright metaphysical. Our storytelling methods didn't shape our minds, it's the other way around. The hero's journey and all its variations are actually products of our natural brain chemistry. That's why I really like using the five stages of grief as a reference point, because it makes it perfectly clear that storytelling is a metaphor for how our minds react to and process stimuli. All protagonists deal with the trauma of losing a loved one over the course of a story. Sometimes that can be an actual person, like Uncle Ben. But throughout a character arc, the protagonist is actually mourning the loss of their past self, and each of the five stages is there to help their ascended form come to terms with that. So how can you use this information in your daily life? And what if you have no interest in writing? The most important thing you need to understand is that you are the protagonist in your own story. But your objective as the main character is not to reach max level, or stockpile loot, or defeat a hypothetical bad guy. Not by any means. The protagonist has an obligation to get to the point where they can help other protagonists on their quests. And it's that collaborative energy that propels our species through time and space. You will defeat villains on your journey, but the demons you fight will be the ones born of your own mind. 
because the only boss fight you have to face in your story is the voice in your head telling you to give up. You should get to the point where anyone else would quit, and you're not gonna stop there! In a lot of storytelling circles, the other world that the protagonist travels to is a representation of their subconscious. The purpose of a character arc, then, is to bring information locked away in the subconscious to the surface. So how do you use this information to hack your mind? It's pretty simple, really. Remember, stories are metaphors for how our minds process events and trauma. Story structuring methods like the dead vector give us a backdoor that allows us to access the hidden source code of our consciousness. If there's anything you think you lack, anything you told yourself you can't do, outline a story about somebody who does the shit better than anybody's ever done it. In the process, two things are gonna happen. First, you literally will have laid out a game plan for how to achieve your goals. All you gotta do then is execute. Obviously, it's not gonna happen the way it does in the movies. You're probably not gonna meet some wise old sage who gives you a laser sword, so just get that idea out of your head. In your story, you gotta be more proactive. Chances are, the reason why you're not in the place you wanna be is because your life is stagnated. You're doing the same thing over and over, hoping for a different outcome. Did I ever tell you the definition of insanity? You're never gonna achieve your goals unless you take some risks. Now, I'm not saying you need to rush into things without a plan. Not at all. Just know that personal growth can only truly begin when you step outside your comfort zone. Second, as you're outlining this story and the protagonist of this alternate universe takes shape, you're gonna start to adopt some of their positive traits. The personality traits that allow them to succeed in the world of the dead will be grafted onto you. You might not ever actually achieve the goal that your protagonist does. However, the experience you gain along the way might become invaluable to someone else who can make that dream a reality meaning you will have completed your journey as a dead vector. Through metamorphosis, you will have transformed into a force that initiates change in others. Even if you don't consider yourself a writer, story structuring methods like the dead vector can be used as a tool to help facilitate mental and physical improvement. If you ever wanted a way to allocate stat points in real life, this is my preferred method. Now I gotta talk to the game developers in the room. Despite the fact that the Dead Vector is themed around video games, it's not actually compatible with gameplay systems. That's because books and movies are passive experiences, whereas games are active ones. You gotta account for that when making a game. If you use a passive story structuring technique to outline a series of cutscenes, then you're just making a movie. And that's fine if that's what you're going for, but you're not taking full advantage of the unique properties of the medium. Luckily, I just so happen to have a method for outlining game stories, but I'm gonna have to save that for a future video. Until then, let me know in the comments if you see any value in the dead vector method. If not, how would you improve it? If you're a storyteller, what's your preferred outline method, and is it cocaine? Twitch, Twitter, and Discord links on screen and in the description. If you liked what you saw in the video and you want to see more, make sure to subscribe. You can also support the channel on Patreon and get access to a super secret Discord channel where I post exclusive music and artwork. That's gonna do it for this one. I'll see you in the afterlife. <laughs>